Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 434, the 10 minute topic edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 10th, 2018. Okay, this is Monday, and because George's schedule and my schedule have opened up, we want to offer something new to Anglican Unscripted viewers. It's called the 10 minute topic where we just for you know we don't do a lot of prep time but there's a topic we want to talk about and we'll just talk for 10 minutes hopefully you'll like it we'll enjoy it make you something to pray about something newsworthy it shows either how much george and i know about a topic or how little george and i know about a topic this is made available by george's sick time how you feeling george i'm getting better i report to work a week from today okay good it's the longest period of enforced inactivity I've had since, uh, gosh, I was Ben's age, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, it's really interesting because normally I get a text or two a week from George. Um, I would say in the last 24 hours when he's starting to go real cabin crazy, 12, 14, 18, 20, Kevin, we should do a show. Any show. Let's just do a show. Gavin, do you want to do a show with Kevin too? Let's do a show. So George is bored. Gavin's going to do a show later. We're going to do these short 10-minute subjects. First topic. Ooh. I'm at a disadvantage, too. Tomorrow, George, I have an outpatient procedure. What might that be? <laughs> I turned 50, and the doctor thinks they want to, to, to examine my innards. And to do that, they, they uh, uh, put a scope inside you, and uh, I, before they do that, it's a day of prep. And that's, this is my day of prep right now, uh, where I can't have any colored fluids whatsoever or colored food. You know, Kevin, they already have cameras there. Why don't you propose to the doctor reality TV series, sure. uh, The Adventures of a Proctologist? Yes. Um, but you know, she's that gone might, wild. Mm -hmm. well, you know, that, you know I, I, I can see that on the Discovery Channel. You know, yes. that would be part of their makeup. What? So I can't have any caffeine today. It's killing me. Uh, uh, no black coffee, no diet soda, uh, no salads. Um, basically, I can have clear Gatorade if I, if I get desperate. And I was desperate five hours ago, so we'll see how this show goes. Today's topic, Pope Francis, the Vatican, silence. Uh, as you know, George, uh, bring us up to date. There's been some big accusations uh, the last couple months. It's been almost a month now mm -hmm. since the Pennsylvania Grand Jury, convened by the Attorney General, released a report documenting uh, evidence of uh, abuse by over 300 clergy and cover-up by the Catholic hierarchy in six of the state's eight dioceses. And it's particularly nailed the current Ar Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal World, who had been Archbishop of Pittsburgh. And it's been about two weeks now since the formal papal nuncio to the United States, Carlo Maria Vigano, uh, released an 11-page document detailing that the fact that the Vatican, specifically Pope Francis, knew about the allegations of misconduct and abuse committed by the then Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, uh, McCarrick. And it's fascinating the responses. The conservative Catholic press has been split. Uh, people who've been hammering Pope Francis have been hammering double time now. But some of the traditional conservatives who oppose him on doctrinal grounds are very hesitant to go forward and hit out. Um, and the, the American secular press, the New York Times and the British press, they've responded to a sex scandal by attacking the whistleblower. The, and, the, you know, this is, you know, we have to be honest. Pope Francis is, is a liberal journalist dream pro-climate change, pro, you know, all these uh, uh, liberal activities. But from what we hear from our friends, he's also conservative on the right issues. He's, you know, certainly a believer. He has a pastor's heart. Um, he's, he's one of the good guys we've heard. And it's difficult to see where this is going to end up in a year, five years or 10 years because of the silence, George. Uh, is this the best strategy? Well, it depends. From a legal strategy, yes, it is. You don't concede anything, you don't give in anything, and then you just hope it goes away. So if, see right now, the press is not doing its job. The documents are out there. There are people out there. The New York Times, for instance, contacted all the people mentioned in uh, the uh, 
Vigano's uh, document, and I think every single one of them declined to say anything. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, well, if reporters just stopped because, well, he wouldn't say anything, we'd no, have no news. <laughs> Nobody is following up. Nobody's doing the investigations. Nobody is talking to the second, third, and fourth tier people who actually typed the documents and filed the documents and read the documents. The documents exist at the Nuncio in Washington and the Vatican. From a legal perspective, the Pope has said, sit on it, don't say anything, don't do anything. So if they're going to come out, unless there's a change of PR strategy, it's going to come out when the Attorney Generals of Pennsylvania and various states, New York State, for example, has started to investigate the Catholic Church. They're going to demand to see the documents. Now, from a PR perspective, when it gets to the Attorney General's suing to release documents of sex crimes cover-up, man, you think you've got grief now, it's only going to get worse. And it is interesting because, you know, people who you thought were going to always be talking and uh, be good representatives of the church, especially here in, in New York, uh, Cardinal Dolan, nothing. You know, there has been a shutdown, not just voluntarily, but I think uh, the Vatican has said don't say anything to anybody about anything. And there's been no rumors or leaks. Maybe, you know, a smidgen here from uh, Vatican, certainly a church militant uh, gets uh, some of their uh, news coming out uh, from someplace. But you're right, this has, you know, been a complete shutdown. And it may be a good legal, legal strategy for the short term, but as a Christian, I think about the victims. As a Christian, I think about, you know, is this glorifying in any way to Christ? Um, that's well, the things that I think about here. At this point, 29 uh, American Catholic bishops, uh, plus Cardinal Burke, who's based in Rome, have released statements calling for investigation and transparency. So that group is big enough now that there's safety in numbers for standing up and calling for accountability. But well, that's 10, 15 percent of the total number of bishops. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that 85, 90 percent of the bishops are cover up or abusers. It means the vast majority are frightened mm. because they may, uh, they don't want to get in bed with the traditional Francis haters and the traditional militant atheists who want to destroy the church. And they're fearful. And this is the natural church reaction. They're fearful of giving ammunition to the people who want to hurt the church. But I'm afraid, Kevin, you're right. By their actions, they're actually doing more damage yeah, yeah, by their I mean, Short term and long term, this is you know, completely damaging to... Kevin, Kevin I know yeah. we got 10 minutes, I know, but I need to, I need to go, go a little further afield. You further afield. have 2 minutes and 50 seconds. It's and just... Every so often we get, well, all the time I get hate letters telling me how mean I am to Catholics. And I don't know anything no, about no, Catholics. Not a Catholic story. This is a, a church story. And, well, you know, this is a universal problem amongst institutional churches. We have a story in Anglican Inc. this morning about an abuser priest who died in prison in England. Okay? Uh, so what? Well, if you dig down deep into the story, you find out that at his trial, one of the victims, 20 years ago, went to the then Bishop of Hull, James Jones, and complained. Jones would go on to become the Bishop of Liverpool and the darling of the media in the church in England. And what was the church's response what to was the allegations? James, what was James Jones's response? Well, allegedly, according to the victim, this has not been adjudicated, he was told, you're slandering this good priest, we'll sue you, in fact, we demand you write a letter of apology to the man who molested you. That's so, the Church of... Yeah, I know. And so it's not a Roman this Catholic is, only is issue. Happening. We're not picking on Roman Catholics. Yeah, in other words, the behavior that is taking place amongst the Catholic bishops in the U.S. right now is behavior that we see in the Church of England bishops. This is what the behavior we had with Skip Gladstone, former bishop of Central New York, in the David Bollinger affair in 2007. Mm, sure. Bollinger was a parish priest who found evidence that his predecessor had been molesting people. And what did Ad Adams do? He brought charges against the priest to yeah, complain. Definitely. So, you know, this is, this is an institutional failing. So, and on this sense, Francis is right. There's a degree of clericalism that is a problem. And that's 10 minutes. We, if you like the show, like it. If you share the show, share it. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. If you want to donate, go to our donate page. I'll put the link in the show notes. 
I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode 434 of Anglican on the screen.